All right, go ahead and open up to Daniel chapter 9. Go ahead and get this out of the way. My voice, if you don't know, may give out a little bit here and there. And I might sound like I'm a little younger than I already am. And it's okay to laugh. I'm, gonna, I'm giving you permission. You can go ahead and chuckle. You can go ahead and, and I won't be offended. So it's okay. But with that in mind, would you pray with me that, that God would just allow me to at least get through this. And after that, who cares? Um, but at least through this. God, we come before you and we ask that you would help us to see what is in your word, help us to understand it, help us to apply it. And God, I ask that you would help me as I prepare to proclaim your word and what it means and, and how we should live in light of it, that you would just allow my voice the strength to get through it. And Lord, Help me to preach what you would have me to preach and nothing else. And I don't, I don't want to say anything that you would not have me say, so help me be focused on your word and the truth that it reveals. And help us to understand it and live it out. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Do we believe that God keeps his word every time? We believe that we should. And if that's true, when God says something, that he's going to do something, then we know he most certainly will do it. And that should give us great comfort, especially when we understand that God said, if you believe in my son, you'll have life and you'll have it forever, everlasting life to the fullest. But it's also true that if God says there's consequences for actions, those consequences are going to happen if we carry them out. You can't have one without the other. And that's exactly what we're going to see this morning. It's exactly what is going to happen to Israel. For a while, Israel was blessed by God because they were obedient, but it didn't last very long. Then they were disobedient. They didn't live out what God told them to do. They didn't keep up their end of the covenant that he made with them at Mount Sinai. And because of that, he brought on the consequences or the curses that he promised would happen to them. And that's how they end up in exile in Babylon in the first place. He said, I will bless you if you keep my commands. If you keep my word, I'll give you the land and I'll bless you in the land. But if you don't, you don't keep my commands, if you don't listen to what I've told you to do, if you don't carry it out, then I'm going to take the land from you. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to punish you for your disobedience. I'm going to curse you. I'm going to take the land from you. You're going to be exiles. This is what God said in Leviticus 26 when he's giving out, here's what the, the law says. Here's what the covenant is. You keep my commands, I'm going to bless you. But if you don't, here's what he says. I will scatter you among the nations, and I will draw a sword to chase after you. So your land will become desolate, and your cities will become ruins. Then the land will make up for its Sabbath years during the time it lies desolate while you are in the land of your enemies. At that time, the land will rest and make up for its Sabbath. So he says, if you don't obey, you're not going to be in the land. You're going to be in the land of your enemies. And then I will allow the land to recover, if you will. And again, this is what happens to Israel. They continually failed for hundreds of years, disobedient to the Lord. And he brought on them what he said he was going to do because he keeps his word. He brought on them the judgment he promised them and sent them into exile. But even in that, there was a hope that God said it wouldn't be forever. You're not going to be there forever. And that's where we find Daniel this morning, in Daniel chapter 9. He's going to rely on that hope that God said, this isn't going to be forever. He's not going to punish us forever. He will relent if we do what he asks us to do in his word. So would you read with me 
Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 is where we'll start, and we'll see our first point that we need to seek God in his word. Daniel 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, a Mede by birth who was made king over the Chaldean kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books according to the word of the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah that the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70. So here we see the setting. It's the first year of King Darius. Babylon has fallen to the Medo-Persian Empire. So, so it's no longer Babylon anymore. It's the empire of the Medes and the Persians. And from Daniel 8 to Daniel 9, there's about 12 to 13 years. So Daniel 8, he had the vision of the ram and the goat and the little horn who we knew as Antiochus Epiphanes. And it's been 12 to 13 years since then. And Daniel receives, or Daniel's reading in the word of the Lord. And this is what he sees. He's in the word and he's reading from the prophet Jeremiah. And in his reading, he comes across likely these verses in Jeremiah 25, 8 and 9. Therefore, this is what the Lord of armies says. Because you have not obeyed my words, I'm going to send for all the families of the north and send for my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and I will bring them against this land, against its residents and against all these surrounding nations. Now we know that happened. Then if we jump ahead a little bit in Jeremiah, we read this. For this is what the Lord says. When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So this is where Daniel's at. Israel disobeys the word of the Lord and finds themselves punished in exile. And Daniel in exile is reading the word of the Lord and comes across 70 years in exile is what you're going to endure. You're going to be there for 70 years under Babylon's reign. But after that, I will restore you. And we, we, we hear that verse that we know of, that we put on pillows and we put on our home. The, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to, you know the rest. <laughs> for your well-being, to give you a future and a hope. And that's great, and that's true, and that's right. And we can take that and, and, and take that and apply it to ourselves. But he's applying it specifically to Israel here. They're in exile, and he tells them that before they go into exile. You're not going to be there forever. I have a plan for you, and it's not over, even though it looks like it is. Because you will call to me. You will seek me, and you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart, and I will restore you. And so this is what Daniel reads. And as Daniel is reading this, that 70 years is almost up. Daniel is in his 80s, at least at this point. And he is understanding that the exile in Babylon, if God said 70 years, and that means it's almost 70 years, we're almost going to go back to the land. And so he's finding himself hopeful, likely. God said this. And if God said it, he's going to do it. So what do we do with this? What do we take from this for us here today? Well, first, again, the first point is seek God and his word. That's what Daniel's doing here. Be in the word. Where are you going to find hope? Where are you going to find encouragement if not here? Where God is telling us what is going to happen, what he's going to do. And if God is 100% on his promises so far, he's going to continue to be that way until the end. So we need to seek God in his word. And Daniel here is a great example of what it looks like to seek God in his word. We seek God in his word to understand more about God. We understand that we seek God in his word to learn more about ourselves, who we are, sinners saved by grace. But here, specifically, Daniel is showing us that we should read God's word to understand what God has said and how we ought to respond in light of it. 
God said to exile 70 years. And because he's never failed on keeping his word, Daniel has hope. It's almost over. 70 years is almost up. We're going to go home. But not only did Daniel find hope, he found the right response to that hope, to the word of God. Obedience, which is exactly what we're going to see Daniel practice in our next set of verses. Daniel doesn't just read the word and say, that's great. 70 years is almost up. He reads the word and he says, that's great. 70 years is almost up. But God said, seek him and find him and pray to him. And then he's going to restore. So Daniel seeks to do just that. Obey the word. To pray to God. To seek him. To confess and to petition. God, do what you said you were going to do. So would you look with me at our, our next set of verses. Our next point. That we need to seek God in humble obedience. And specifically here we see Daniel do that through prayer and repentance. Verses 3 to 9. So I turned my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and petitions with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Ah, Lord the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keeps his commands. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your commands and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, leaders, fathers, and all the people of the land. Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but this day... Public shame belongs to us, the men of Judah, the residents of Jerusalem and all Israel, those who are near and those who are far in all the countries where you have banished them because of the disloyalty they have shown toward you. Lord, public shame belongs to us, our kings, our leaders, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God. Though we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the Lord our God by following his instructions that he set before us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has broken your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. And the promised curse written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. He has carried out his words that he spoke against us and against our rulers by bringing on us a disaster that is so great and that nothing like it has been done to Jerusalem and has never been done under all of heaven. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquities and paying attention to your truth. So the Lord kept the disaster in mind and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all he has done, but we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a strong hand and made your name renowned as it is to this day, we have sinned, we have acted wickedly. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, may your anger and wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of ridicule to all those around us. Therefore, our God, hear the prayer and petitions of your servant. Make your face shine upon your desolate sanctuary for the Lord's sake. Listen closely, my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that bears your name. For we are not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous acts, but based on your abundant compassion. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. My God, for your own sake, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. I want to pray like that. I want to pray like Daniel prays. Daniel, having been in the word and understanding that the 70 years was almost up, understood what needed to happen before they could return to the land. 
He understood that God told them in the law of Moses that for God to restore them in the land after they were removed for disobedience, they would first have to humble themselves, confess their sins, repent, and pray to God for restoration. That's what he said. Leviticus 26. But when they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their ancestors, their unfaithfulness that they practiced against me and how they acted with hostility toward me and I acted with hostility toward them and brought them into the land of their enemies. And when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. Repent, humble yourself, confess and seek me, and then I will remember my covenant. Then I will remember the land. Daniel likely knew that. He was in the words of the Lord. And then he gets to the prophet Jeremiah and reads that the 70 years is almost up. But he knows this has to happen first. And so he does exactly that. He humbly goes to God in prayer. He confesses not only his sins, but the sins of the father's. He prays his God for who he is. He seeks to repent. He prays and petitions God, restore us, but not for our sake, but for your sake, Lord, restore us for your name, for your glory. I want us to look specifically at how Daniel speaks of himself and the people of Israel versus how he speaks of God. And it is drastically different. He says, we have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, turned away from your commands and ordinances. I don't know if he was looking at a thesaurus or not, but it kind of seems like he was. Because he said over and over in different ways, we messed up, we sinned, we've done wrong, acted wickedly. And I'm sure you could find a few other ways to say that. But he wanted to get the point across, we did this. We fell short. We sinned against you. We failed to follow your commands, what you told us to do. But you, God, are great and awe-inspiring. You keep your gracious covenant. And he kept it for a long time, even through their disobedience. He was not quick to anger with them. He was slow to anger. He was great and awe-inspiring, and he kept the covenant. He says, God, you sent prophets to correct and warn us. Over and over and over again, God would raise up someone and send them to his people and said, turn back. Stop sinning. Come back to me. Listen, repent, and I will relent what is coming for you. I won't do it if you would only repent and follow my word. Over and over again, he was long suffering with them. He did not want to bring it upon them, but he would if they would not repent. That's what Daniel says, but we have not listened. We didn't listen to your prophets. We didn't listen. Our leaders didn't listen. Our fathers didn't listen. You warned us, but we didn't listen. And so shame belongs to Israel. Shame belongs to us. Righteousness belongs to you, though, God. Righteousness belongs to you who are compassionate and forgiving. We brought shame upon ourselves, but you are righteous. Israel failed to keep the covenant and brought upon themselves the curses that God promised he would do. He said, I will do it. They didn't believe him. Yet he did it, and Daniel proclaims and declares, God, you are still righteous. Even through it, you are righteous. You are right to do it. You are right to send us into exile. You are right to bring the curses that you promised upon us, because you are righteous, and all that you do is right. Because, God, you brought us out of Egypt. You made your name great. You rescued us. Yet, we forgot who you are. We sinned. We acted wickedly. 
We brought ridicule upon your people in your holy mountain. We did that. And so Daniel ends, God, we need your face to shine upon us again. Make your face shine upon your desolate sanctuary, but not for us, for your name's sake. For you, Lord, based on not our righteousness, because they have done over and over again, wickedly sinned, rebelled, failed to repent, failed to listen. But because of your name, Lord, make your face shine upon us. He's pleading with God. Hear this prayer. Forgive us. Listen and act for your name's sake. Because we've brought ridicule upon your name. Daniel understood that they were a representation upon God. For their disobedience, they brought shame on the name of God. And he knows to restore that, to make it right, God, you've got to act. You've got to make your face shine upon us again. Forgive us, restore us for you. So what do we do with that? Just like we need to be in the word and seek God in his word, we need to seek to humbly obey the word. Do we pray in this way? Do we really? I don't more, more often than not. Do we humbly approach God in prayer in this way? Lifting him high, making us low? Or do we come to God and just ask for things? Do you say, God, just give me this. Help me with this. We say, God, you are great. You are awe-inspiring. You are righteous. You have abundant compassion. You forgive. But me, I'm a sinner. I'm wicked. I don't listen to your word. And because I don't do that, I make your name look less great than it should. So God, forgive, restore, help me to make your name great. Because if we are in Christ, we bear his name. And what we do plays a part in representing God. If we act wickedly, then the world's going to look at us and say, I don't want that God. He must be wicked. Because if this is what his people does, I don't want him. But if we go out and we obey the word, if we seek to make his name great, then they should see that and give him glory. That's the whole Matthew 5, salt and light. Let him see your good works and give glory, not to us, but to you, God, to our Father in heaven. So do we pray in this way? Do we humbly approach God in prayer as we should? Do we confess our sins, both individually and corporately? You notice how Daniel prays here? He's not only saying, God, forgive me. God, make, make it right where I've messed up. He says, no, forgive Israel. Forgive us for what we've done. Forgive our father's iniquities. Help us to do right. It's not just an individual thing. It's a, all of the people of God confessing that they have fallen short and asking God to, to make his name great anyway. Do we seek to repent where necessary? Do we live with an understanding that we are a reflection on God? Do we live to make much of God's name or our name? And I love this. Do we get in the word and let it fuel our prayer lives? That's what Daniel does here. We start out with Daniel in the word, reading the word of the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah. And it says, and then I began to pray. I was reading your word, Lord, and I came across this, and it led me to pray. Do we let that happen? Do we read the word of the Lord and then respond by going to God and talking to him about it? One commentator noted that eight, as much as 85% of this prayer that Daniel prays is a reference or an allusion to somewhere else in Scripture. So he's not just making this up. 
He's been in the word, pouring over it, and then goes to God and said, God, you said this. I'm reminding you of this. Help me to live what you set out. Because as we get in the word, it should fuel our prayer lives. It should lead us to come before God and to humbly obey him. Because he's praying based on what God says. Because he's being obedient to what God says. If you seek me, you'll find me. If you would repent, if you would ask for forgiveness, you'll receive it. It'll happen. So that's our charge. Seek God in humble obedience just as Daniel does here by going to the word and then going to him in prayer and then living it out. I think it's worth noting also that Daniel is one of the few in scripture that we don't find anything that he does unrighteous. We can read all of Daniel and we can find nothing to say, well, you shouldn't have done that, Daniel. Man, you fell short there. Yet we look at all the rest of scripture and our heroes of the faith, we can find over and over things that they've done wrong. And they do. They, they pray for repentance. They pray for forgiveness. But Daniel, we don't find anything, yet he still understands I'm sinful. I'm wicked. I've sinned along with Israel. That was an interesting, interesting side note. Didn't really have anything to do with what comes next. But our final point is that we need to seek God even when it's confusing. And it's going to get confusing here at the end. We're not going to know what to do with it a lot of the time, but we're going to read it anyway. We're going to seek to live in light of it, to humbly obey God. 20 to 27. While I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my petition before the Lord my God concerning the holy mountain of my God, while I was praying, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the first vision, reached me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me this explanation. Daniel, I've come now to give you understanding. At the beginning of your petitions, an answer went out, and I have come to give it, for you are treasured by God. So consider the message and understand the vision." Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one, the ruler, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will re be rebuilt with a plaza and a moat, but in difficult times. After those 62 weeks, the anointed will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the coming ruler will destroy the city and the sanctuary, the end will come with a flood, and, the en and until the end there will be war. Desolations are decreed. He will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering, and the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. Everybody understand? Everybody got it? Good, we can go home. So Daniel is reading God's word. He's understood that the time of the exile was coming to an end, and he prayed in such a way that would lead God to remember his word and to make it come about. And then we see, as he's praying, the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel, and he has an answer to Daniel's prayer. And we read that as soon as Daniel began to pray is when the answer went out. Isn't that remarkable? God already knew what he was going to pray. He said, here's your answer, Daniel. When you're done, I'll, it'll be there. And the answer is said to come because Daniel was treasured or greatly loved by God. And here's just another side note. We can see this even in the New Testament, this type of situation being presented. 
If we look at James 5.16, it says the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. That's Daniel. <laughs> Daniel is indeed a righteous person. Again, we don't find anything in the book of Daniel that says, Daniel, that, that wasn't great. And that's why God is quick to answer his prayer. So take that as you would. The prayers of a righteous person are very powerful in its effect. Nevertheless, Daniel or Gabriel came to Daniel and began to deliver the message he was sent to deliver. And he shows him this vision. And to say that this vision is not what Daniel has expected is a bit of an understatement. God, I don't know what you're showing me. I thought the 70 years was almost up and we were going to be back to, to good. We were going to be solid. Not exactly. <laughs> but it helps us to see the need to seek God even when it's confusing or not what we expected. Because this is confusing and not what Daniel expected. The vision that Gabriel shows Daniel is regarding 70 weeks. And it's not 77 day weeks here. It is 70 weeks of years. So 77 year periods. So 490 years. I had to write it down, otherwise I'd have forgot. 490 years is what this vision spans. And I'm not going to get into the breakdown of, of here's everything that happens here and here and when and how because that's just not helpful really for this. <laughs> but during the 70 weeks, Gabriel reveals to Daniel these specific things are going to happen. And these are the things that I want us to hold on to. He says, during the 70 weeks, rebellion will come to an end. There will be a stop to sin. Iniquity would be atoned for. Everlasting righteousness will be brought about. Vision and prophecy will be sealed up. And the most holy place will be anointed. These are the main events of the vision that Daniel receives from Gabriel. But then Gabriel gets a little more specific and a little more confusing. He says, from the issue to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one, a ruler, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Again, I'm not getting into when and where and how this all plays out. But during that time, Jerusalem would be rebuilt in difficult times. At the end then of that 62 weeks that comes after the seven weeks, the anointed one that was to come will be cut off and have nothing then after that, the people of this coming ruler, who is the Antichrist of Revelation, would destroy the city and destroy the sanctuary. So help us a little bit here. If we remember back to Daniel 7, that fourth beast is Rome, and that little horn that comes up is the Antichrist of the end times. But we know that it wouldn't be when Rome was an empire, because that's in the past, right? So there was this aspect that there would be already Rome, and then a Rome-like empire to come, where that leader would come up. That's, that's what we're talking about here. So the people that would follow this leader to come would destroy the city and the temple in Rome. The Romans did it. Are we clear? I'm probably confusing more than helping at this point. But the people of a coming ruler, the, the Antichrist, would destroy the city and the sanctuary. We know that happened in AD 70. And this coming ruler that has still yet to come would make a covenant for the last week, that last seven years, that last seven years of the 70 weeks, would make a covenant in the middle of the week likely with just the people of Israel, and that he would stand in the middle of the week, stop the sacrifices and offerings of the temple, and instead put an abomination in the temple. And that would all happen until God poured out destruction on this desolator, this ruler that's to come at the end. So again, we all got it? We all clear? Everyone understand the vision? Well, that's good if you don't, because you're not alone. One commentator said this regarding this particular passage. The 70 weeks vision or prophecy of, of this section represents not only the greatest interpretive challenge to the book of Daniel, 
but may possibly be the most difficult passage to interpret in all of the Old Testament. So we're in pretty good hands. If that commentator said it's nobody, got, nobody knows. Nobody understands it. So if you don't understand it, don't feel bad because no one else does either. But as I've said before in previous weeks, the main point of studying the end times and studying passages like this is not to have every little detail figured out. The main point is to realize God's got it figured out. He knows what's going to happen. He said what's going to happen. And again, he keeps his word every time. So he knows what's going to happen. And then we ultimately know what's going to happen. It all works out in the end. God will reign with his people forever. And so that's what we need to take away from this. Not what does the 70 weeks or 70 weeks of years mean? And when does it start? When does it end? When is the seven going to come at the end? That's fine if you want to try to figure that out, but don't miss the main point. Seek God even when it's confusing. So when curveballs come like they did here with Daniel, there's two options that we can come away with, two options that we can start with. We can question God and his plan. God, what are you doing? What is this? 70 weeks of years, a desolator in the temple. I don't understand it. Or... We can just trust God and his plan that he's going to make it all work out. So I, I choose, trust God, don't worry so much about figuring out the 70 weeks. Because he's never failed and he's not going to start now. And he says the destruction will come upon this desolator. And earlier we see that the kingdom of God will be set up. It will come. Because even though this timeline in Daniel is hard to grasp, those definitive things are going to happen. And they're what we can grab onto and help us to trust God even when we are immensely confused. So those things that we can grab on again are rebellion will come to an end. A certain it will come to an end. And here, likely, God is pointing to Jesus' death on the cross. The rebellion of Israel is climaxed in that, having the Messiah killed by the hands of the Romans. So rebellion will come to an end. There will be a stop to sin. When Christ returns, you better believe sin is done. It's gone. Iniquity will be atoned for. Happened on the cross. Iniquity, your iniquity, my iniquity, the iniquity of all those who believe in Jesus, Atoned for, gone, done, paid, your set. Everlasting righteousness will be brought about. When Christ returns, that, that righteousness that we've been given, but yet don't get, really get to live out yet, will be made to be lived out in the end. When Christ returns, that everlasting righteousness will be all that we know. Vision and prophecy will be sealed up. When Christ returns, this is going to be a complete history book. We can look back and say, praise God that you made it all happen the way you, you said you would, but I don't got to worry about it anymore. I'm just living for you, praising you, doing what I can to enjoy your presence. The most holy place will be anointed. When Christ returns, the most holy place will be everywhere because Jesus is there. He is the temple. If we look at Revelation, there's no need for a temple anymore, right? Because God and the Lamb are its temple. The city and the sanctuary would be destroyed. And again, just to give us that hope that God says, what God says will happen, happened. Again, eighty seventy, that temple was destroyed. The city was destroyed at the hands of the people of the coming ruler. And the last one, the coming ruler will be judged and the decreed destruction will be poured out on the desolator. That's how we end the chapter. It will happen. It's going to happen. The desolator may reign for a time, but eventually the judgment that came upon Israel that God promised is going to come on this desolator, this ruler that's to come. He's going to do away with him. He's going to receive the punishment he deserves. We should take joy in that fact, which is kind of weird to say that, yeah, destruction. But knowing what this guy is going to do, 
I think it's okay to have joy at that. So what do we do with Daniel 9? Seek God in his word, as Daniel does. Seek God in humble obedience, based on that word, as Daniel does. And seek God even when it's confusing, as Daniel likely would have continued to do. We have the track record that he, he may lay sick in his bed for a few days. He may not understand what God is saying. But eventually, he's just going to get up and he's going to keep praying. He's going to keep living. He's going to keep doing what God has called him to do. He's going to keep seeking God even when he's confused. We should do no less. Seek God even when it's confusing, even when we don't fully understand, God, what are you doing? I don't understand what this means. I don't understand why you would do this. But God does. He's got the plan. He's got it all figured out. And it'll come to be just as he said it would be. So take hope in that. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for the ability to gather together, to praise your name, to lift your name high. Thank you for your word that gives us encouragement, that gives us instruction, that gives us hope. Help us to live in light of it. Help us to seek you in your word. And help us to seek to live out what you have called us to do in humble obedience from your word. And help us to continue to seek you even when things are crazy and chaotic and confusing, knowing that for you, it's as calm as could be. You are not struggling. You are not trying to figure out how am I going to make this happen. You've already seen it play out and you know exactly when, where, and how it will play out. Help us to to rest in that. And God, ultimately help us to just know you. Help us to believe in you. Because without believing in you, there's no need to seek you in your word. It's pointless. If we don't know you, then it's just words on a page. If we don't know you, then we can't obey you because we don't have your spirit to allow us to do that. If we don't know you, then all of this world is confusing. And we have no hope to rest on. So first and foremost, Lord, help us to make sure that we are in you, that we know you, that we believe in you and your son. And God, if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't, I pray that they would come and would meet you because you're waiting to meet them. You're waiting to forgive them. You're waiting to restore them, to give them your righteousness and to work within them to make your name great, to build your kingdom. So God, I pray that you would do that, that if there's someone here who doesn't know, you would work in their heart and bring them to a place of repentance and belief and faith in you to find life everlasting. God, we love you, and we pray this in your son's name. Amen.